Okay, are you recording? Yeah. Okay, okay so, so we're going to drop, drop this ball, ball and we're, we're going to make sure that, that we can track it all the way through. through. Okay, okay ready? ready? Three, two, two one. everybody today I'm going to show you how to use tracker 6 and DaVinci Resolve video editing software to get the best tracking out of your handheld smartphone video this part is going to be in four parts there's going to be uh, we're going to be talking about what to do when you film the video prepare the video and then how to edit the video then how to track the video and then finally how to edit all the data that you're going to get in Excel so before you even start do with the video editing portion you have some things that you can do with the phone itself when you're recording it to make sure that you can get clean tracking out of it. So the first thing that you can do is brace the camera somewhere. So keep it steady. Uh, that can reduce a lot of the shakes. If you have a tripod, then definitely use it because that tripod's going to keep everything nice and stable. Even those little tripods, which are great because you can put it in your backpack. They don't weigh very much and they'll hold your phone perfectly steady for a recording. Uh, you could also do things like adjusting the lighting and the contrast. Make sure that you have enough light in your scene that the camera can pick up on the tracks and that the object that you're going to be using has enough contrast with the surrounding area so that you could spot it out uh, much more easily when you're doing the tracking. But once you go ahead and go into DaVinci Resolve, uh, that's when you're going to manipulate the recordings that you've gotten. So let's go ahead and do that. So let's load up DaVinci. And the link to download DaVinci is going to be in the uh, comment below. And it's free to use software, although there's some features that you have to pay for. But nothing here we're going to need to pay for. So you go ahead and just create a new project. Give it a name. Lab Project 4 in our case. Okay. And then you're going to be loaded with this big old scene here. So go to your media tab at the bottom. File, Import, Media. Okay, so this is the file I'm going to want. I've loaded it in. I'm going to go to the Edit tab now down here at the bottom my media pool. I'm just going to click and drag it in. Okay, it's going to take a minute to fetch all of the frames. I'm going to right click on this audio waveform and just delete the selection since we don't need that anymore. Okay, let's go ahead and play it and try it out. As you can see, we've got a little bit of a handheld shake going on. So we're going to reduce that handheld shake. And also the actual area that we're going to be needing to use is pretty small compared to the whole frame that we captured. So we're going to reduce that size. So let's do the stabilization first. You have a couple of different stabilization options. Uh, we have perspective, similarity, and translation. So I'm going to try similarity. And I'm going to hit camera lock. It's going to make the camera basically stay still, act as if the camera was on the tripod. And I'm going to unclick zoom. Uh, zoom will, will, of course, zoom in on the clipped areas. And you'll see that in just a second what I mean. But I'm going to unclip it because we're going to zoom in later on. So just going to stabilize. It's going to analyze here. OK, and let's go ahead and play. It's a bit more stable. You can see a little bit of wobbling, and that'll come into play when we do the Excel portion, but not right now. It's not too bad. And you can see these black areas that show up on the sides here, and that's because we clicked, we unclicked the zoom, so it's not zooming in to fill those black areas. It's just letting them go. Let us, before we do the zoom in, we're going to do a grid, and we're going to correct for some distortion first. So I'm going to click the Effects Library button right here, and I'm going to grab my grid and just drag it in. Now you're going to go to the Effects icon right here, and then just fiddle with it. Depending on your footage, uh, you're going to need requirements on, on how you exactly want it to look. But I'm going to do mine based on, on how I want mine. So, you know, it looks like the horizontal on this one was pretty good. It doesn't need much. The vertical, um, I'm comparing it not so much with the stick, but with the windows here. And the vertical actually looks pretty good. So I'm not going to need to do any rotations. But if, if yours are off, then you'll just go ahead and once you get the grid, you like click back on the video. And then you're going to go to your rotation angle. And you can get a fine rotation angle by clicking here and just doing that like that until you get like what you want. But since we don't need to rotate this one, I think we're pretty good. I'm also looking for camera distortion. And you can see a little bit of it right here. There's not too much of a gap at the top of the building here, but then the gap widens here and then narrows here. In reality, this building is, the top of this building is flat, but the camera distortion makes it kind of uh, sink in a little bit. So we are going to go to lens correction, distortion. I'm going to check analyze and just see what it does. Okay. And my mom's telling me that uh, I need to purchase this. So we're going to turn off lens correction. But normally you'd be able to push in or push out either concave or convex the image to uh, get it aligned just the way you want it. But I don't have that feature in DaVinci. We can do it in Blender. In fact, all of this you can do in Blender if you're familiar with Blender. But uh, we're just going to leave it as is. Okay. We don't need the grid anymore. We've done our vertical horizontal alignments. We'll kill the grid. Oop. All right. Now let's uh, take care of this zoom here. So I'm just going to zoom these guys in and move the position X because I want the whole trajectory of our ball from start to end to show up. So from the time it's released to the time it hits the ground. And I want it to show up in this frame. So let's make sure that's going to happen. Yep. So right there, that's where our ball impacts. 
and right there's where he releases it. So now that we've zoomed in, we've stabilized, we've did our tilt adjustment to rotation adjustment. I'm going to go ahead and clip and change the timeline here so that we're only going to keep what we actually want to track. So from the moment the ball is released to the moment it hits the ground. So let's scrub this forward. Right there, that looks like where it's going to hit. All right. So let's drag this guy in. Now, for whatever reason, sometimes DaVinci doesn't capture this last frame, so we may have to extend it by one frame. And yeah, that's exactly what happened. So I'm just going to push this guy out. Okay, so we hit right there. We're getting some bounce up. So I'm just going to do this just to make sure that we get exactly what we wanted. Okay, so now that we've trimmed our clip to the exact timeline that we want, I'm just going to drag it back over to the beginning there. Okay, now this is the time that we're going to play with the contrast. So we can push the colors and the contrast up and out and around so that we can get that object that we're tracking to really stand out, especially against the elements of the environment where the colors are matching. And you see what I mean right here? Let's scrub it to where the ball is in front of the glass. There's a couple of frames. So you can see the ball pretty good right here, but once it gets to this portion of the glass, it kind of disappears. Now this isn't too bad because we can still see the object and we don't need to do any really color adjustments. We're going to be able to track it pretty good. But let's say this was a little bit more harder of a clip. Uh, say the... Um, the coffee filters clip. Uh, the coffee filters are white, and you're going to be dropping them on um, some pretty shiny surfaces, the tables, the floors. They're going to be reflecting the white lights. So the coffee filters in those situations are just going to completely disappear. And in fact, we can open up a project that has that. So let me see if I can do that real quick. So in this clip, I am dropping a coffee filter. And we have the white coffee filter, and it tracks pretty good until you get to the floor. And it's a little bit harder to track, especially since we have some motion blur going on. Um, it just disappears a little bit. So this is a good example. This one will be a good example of what we can do to make the color and the contrast really pop to make sure that this stands out. So let's go ahead and go over here. I'm going to go ahead and just make everything black and white. And that way we can just play with the values. So let's go ahead and see what we can do with the shadows. Okay, dropping the shadows. Let's change some of the highlights. Okay, highlights didn't really work. We just blew it out and it just, as you can see, it completely disappeared. So, and let's see if we can change some of the... Okay, so this mid detail, uh, if I go all the way to the left, it's going to make everything nice and soft, uh, which is good for that dreamy look if you want, uh, but you could really get the clarity up if you crank it all the way to 100. Let's see if we can play with the contrast. All right, that's good. Now, there's a science to these color wheels, and um, I found just playing with them, since I don't know the science exactly of them, but just play with it, get what you want. All right, so that looks substantially more separated than before, and I think the rest of it was pretty separated. So that's an example of where you will want to use, how you will want to use the color wheels to get that. So what we've done on the previous clip was that we had did the grid so that we can get the alignment. We stabilized it and we cropped it uh, by zooming in just the way we wanted it. Uh, that one, it was pretty clear. So we used this coffee filter example to get the contrast in the color. So the next step would actually be to render it. Okay, so once the color is done, the way you would like it to do it to get it to stand out, uh, you are ready now to render it. So we're going to hit the deliver tab here at the bottom of the little rocket ship. And give your file a name. So we're going to call it... Uh, uh, lab, toss, one, I don't know. All right, so audio, you don't need audio, so click the audio button, unclick export audio. Instead of QuickTime, we're going to want MP4. Uh, frame rate, so I'm going to check the frame rate of this guy here. I'm going to right-click him, show more options, uh, properties, and details, and it says 240 frames per second, so I think it's probably an error of some sort, and we're really looking at 24 frames per second. So when I deliver it, we're going to make sure that we're at 24 frames per second. Everything else is good. Add to the render queue. Uh, go ahead and just click OK and render all. It's going to take a second to render it, and in fact, it's already done. So let's go ahead, and now we're going to open Tracker to edit this thing. If you're low on memory, uh, go ahead and close DaVinci Resolve, and that way you'll have enough memory for Tracker to do its work in Excel when we open it up. So in Tracker 6, file, open file. We're going to find the file that we just did, which uh, I can't even remember what we called it. Labtoss is 01. Okay, I'm going to open this guy up. All right. There are a few things that we can do on here just to make our life easier when we go into Excel. Uh, one of them is critical, and that is going to be your calibration stick. The other one is optional, and that's going to be your coordinate system. But I like to do coordinate system, and we'll tell you why. So if you click this coordinate axis here, you're going to have your X axis and your Y axis. Go ahead and drag this crosshair thing over to where that ball is going to be first released. That is going to be your 0x coordinate point. When that ball is initially released, that is the 0x coordinate point. Okay, so as it's going to the left, it's going to increase in value. That's what we want for the x-coordinate. Now, for the y-coordinate, I like to have the impact point. If I'm dropping stuff, the impact point being 0, y0. So I'm going to put it all the way on the ground. And in fact, I'm going to scrub forward just to make sure that that ball is hitting that line, which it, it close enough is. We're going to fix that in Excel, that little bit that it's off. So we're good to go on our coordinates. Um, now let's go ahead and do our calibration stick. So I'm going to go to Track, New, Calibration Tools, Calibration Stick. It's going to bring up this blue line here. 
and you're going to drag it across to whatever your calibration stick was that you used. Or, I'm sorry, not calibration stick, but um, oh, what was it? Yeah, it was a calibration stick. So you're going to drag it over to whatever your measuring stick was that you used when you recorded it. So here we used a two-meter stick. Okay. I'm just going to put one end up there and one end down there. Okay, now it's a two-meter stick, so I'm going to go up to the length. I'm going to change it to two meters, and there we go. Now, you can see our angle from x-axis is a little off. That's because he had it, the stick tilted, and that's okay. That doesn't matter. But you are also going to notice when you compare the the meter stick with the blue line, it's going to kind of curve. It's going to actually feel like the blue line is curving or that the, the meter stick is curving. This is actually the result of the camera distortion. Both of these lines are perfectly straight. It's just that the camera distorts things either in a convex or concave fashion, depending on what the lens is like. Uh, and we could have fixed that and we tried to fix that, but we needed that add-on. So it wasn't going to be that big of a deal. You can see it's, it's a minor thing. This will actually show up in our Excel graph. It's kind of a little dip. Um, and I'll show it to you when we do that. But this isn't a big deal at all. All right. So let's zoom out. Now that we have our coordinate axis and our calibration stick in place, we're going ready to track. So let's go to track, new, point of mass. Zoom in on that ball. And let's go back to the beginning. I'm going to shift and click. And it is going to automatically advance. Now, in this particular clip, the ball never got that much speed to have a significant motion blur. But in other ones, you might have motion blur, especially if you're closer to the object. And in that case, your object is going to stretch out. It's going to be more of a football shape. And that's going to be where you're going to decide, are you going to continue to hit the center of a mouse so that it's blue? Are you going to hit the center of the ball? Or are you going to remember what that shape was and apply it to the beginning of that blur? So if this is the football shape blur, are you going to up here where that shape was? Or are you going to click the center of the bar? Do whatever you want to do, but be consistent about it. Don't change one way or the other. And if you're going to do something that's a little bit harder to track, like the um, coffee filters, and then I would recommend taking a Sharpie or something and putting a, a dark mark on the coffee filter. And that way, when the coffee filter really starts to blur, that track mark in part is going to blur a little bit less, easier to track. Um, so I recommend doing that. But yeah, whatever it does, just be consistent about it. I choose the center of the blur and just gauge where the center is. And that's how I do it. Again, I'm shift clicking to get to that last frame. All right, so that's the last frame. You got these two unit graphs here. And these are going to be your QC, your quality control points, because let's say one of your tracks is like really off. Let's say number eight, you just like put it way over here for whatever reason. When you look at your tracks, you're going to see, oh, this guy's a little bit off, you know. So you click on him and then you're like, wow, he's way over there. Just recenter him like that and smooth it back out. So we got some pretty good tracks here. So we got our Y axis and our X axis. Everything looks really good on that one. And let's just... All right, so what you're seeing here is a glitch. If you're on a Windows 11 system or using an NVIDIA GPU, you may encounter this glitch. Um, I remember where things are, so just click where you want, and it should show up. Otherwise, you have to save and close the whole program and reopen it. All right, so I want everything in this chart here. All right, so I controlled 8, everything, select it all, and I copied it. Now we're done with Tracker. I recommend saving it as a track file so that you can pull it up later. I have 10 copies of these because I've been practicing, even though it doesn't show. So I'm not going to save it, but we are going to open up Excel now. So this brings us to the final part of this video tutorial, and it's going to be a bit long, uh, so I'm sorry about that. All right. So go ahead and paste all of your data in there. Now, I don't like this format of numbering, so I'm going to click this little triangle button, select all of my cells, and I'm going to go to my number tab, and I'm going to collect this little down arrow, click on number, and let's give us five decimal places. Okay, now I want enough room to see everything, so while the cells are all still collected, or selected, I'm sorry, you go between A and B, you're going to get this double arrow, drag it out to what you like. I like 200, it's a nice number. And you see we have plenty of room now. Okay, we don't need this mass A uh, header at all, so click on the number one, left click on it, now right click on it, delete, shifts everything up. Now these three headers, we're going to change. And since this is raw, right out of Tracker 6, we're going to call them raw. So time, raw, x-axis, raw, y-axis, raw. Okay, I can't spell. All right. And I'll tell you why we did raw. Because we need to manipulate these just a little bit. Because you see our x value here, this is our starting x value. It's at a negative 0, 0, 0, 6, 1. We actually want that to be 0. So we're going to create an x corrected column where we're going to offset all of these values by that amount. Same thing with the y raw. We actually wanted the y value to be 0. And so we're going to adjust all of those. If you didn't adjust your timeline um, by clipping the the clip, clipping the clip, trimming the clip uh, to the right times for the beginning and the ending, you may have times in the negative value, or it may start too late, or whatever the case is, and then we would have a time corrected. Here it starts at zero. That's the way we wanted it. So we're still going to make a time corrected column just for consistency, but we're not going to do anything with it. So let's go ahead and do that. Time corrected, x-axis corrected, and y-axis corrected. Okay. So our x-axis, we want it to start at zero, all right? So we're going to offset it by this value. So x equals this value minus what we want to correct it by. So it's a double negative. It's going to be a positive. It's going to bring us up to zero. So watch it. That little box right there, just double click it, and goes all the way down. So all these values have been offset by this exact amount. So it keeps the values between steps still are the same. It's just everything's been shifted down a little bit. We're going to do the exact same thing on the y, but the y we want to end at zero. So we're going to subtract everything by that amount. 
Try again, and double click that little box, and there we go. We ended at zero. Now the time I said we didn't need to correct, but we're gonna copy it over anyways. So equals, click on that cell, that double click the box, and everything is down. So let's go ahead and make this nice and um, good looking. Go ahead and select your your table here, format as table, and you have this wide variety of things that'll look nice. Uh, let's go ahead and do this one. Do any one you want. Just make sure that my table has headers is selected. It's pretty nice, doesn't it? All right. So now we're gonna do the acceleration and the velocities. Or yes, velocity first and then acceleration. So let's do x velocity, y velocity. All right. Velocity x and we're gonna name this one too. Velocity. Why? All right, so velocity is distance over time, change in distance over change in time, right? So we can do it as the current distance, the current time, minus the previous distance, previous time. If we do that, you'll notice we have nothing in the previous because we have the current x and we have nothing before that. So this first cell we can't use. So we're gonna have to start at the second cell here. So I'm actually gonna gray these guys out so I don't actually like put something in there. And the same thing for our raw values here, just to make sure that we don't accidentally use them, we're gonna gray them out since we don't want to use these raw values at all. all right. There is a way to lock those cells, um, but it's a little bit tedious, and just as long as they're grayed out, you'll, you'll know. All right, so let's do this. Again, velocity is distance over time, so equals. We're going to do the parentheses, slash the parentheses, because the distance change is going to go here, and the time change is going to go here. So distance, we have our current distance minus our previous distance, our current time minus our previous time. Okay, And you see it already gave us a new value right there. It filled it all in. But this is our x velocity. We'll do the same thing for the y. Now, there's a problem with this, and we'll talk about that in just a second. So if anybody's screaming at the screen, because you know what change we're going to have to do, just, just hold on, just hold on. All right, so current minus previous distance, and current time minus previous time. There we go. Again, it fills it all in. All right, so how does everything look? Good. Our velocity looks like it's decreasing, as it should. And the x velocity actually looks pretty stable, stable as it should. All right, so let's just go ahead and graph you. I, I told you, uh, warned you that there was going to be an issue, and we'll take a look at it right now. So I'm selecting my velocity, my corresponding times. I'm going to go to insert. I'm going to insert a scatter chart. And take a look at the sky. Wobble, 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 wobble. All right, let's take a look at the sky. And okay. Insert. All right, this one's not too bad, but still wobble, 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 wobble. It's because we're doing the current time versus the just previous recorded time. Um, so we're getting them as close together as possible, but any noise in any one of those is gonna show up. So a way to reduce some of that noise um, and still get our values that we want is we're gonna split up that current time versus previous time or current distance minus the previous distance. We're gonna do one in the future and one in the past. And then that's gonna give us the change, the current change. Uh, and it's gonna be a little bit cleaner. So let's go to our velocity. And instead of current, I'm gonna select future. And instead of current time, I'm gonna select future time. And if I get rid of that little icon there, so again, double click to propagate it all the way down. And you're like, oh, that doesn't look any better. But, okay, we gotta delete this guy. Let's see how much our values are. And let's step back so we can see. So we have a spread of 4.2 down to 3.7, so that's a spread of 0.5, right? And now look, we have a spread of 3.8 to 4.1. So now we have a variance of 0.3 instead of 0.5. And the reason why I deleted that last uh, button down there, that last value down there, you see how it curves up sharply? Boop. It's because it is, it is trying to capture a time and a distance that has not happened, something in the future. And you can't do that. So we're gonna delete that velocity. But we're also gonna make the same change here for this guy. So we're gonna take one in the future and one in the past. Okay, distance in the future and time in the future. I'm gonna propagate it down. All right, so how do our charts look? They look pretty good. Okay, we'll come back to the charts. I'm gonna delete these guys really quick, but we need to work on acceleration. All right, so see this little icon right there? That little, I don't know, arrow looking thing. Just grab that guy, drag him over by two. We're gonna make an acceleration. And acceleration Y. All right, so acceleration is change in velocity over change in time. So we're gonna use the exact same method that we use to find the velocity with distance. But instead of using the distance, we're gonna use the velocity. And as you noticed, we had to skip that first value on the velocity and skip that last value on the velocity. Let's just fill that in. We're gonna have to do the same thing. We can't take a value of velocity that didn't exist, right? So we're not gonna be able to fill in this first or second step on the acceleration. So let's just gray those guys out. Gray that guy out. And here we go. Equals parentheses slash parentheses because it's going to be our velocity change, change in velocity, one step in the future minus one step in the past, okay, over our change in time. So time in the future minus time in the past. Hit enter. Okay, and you see it gives us this crazy value and this really crazy value right here because it's trying to change the acceleration from zero. And I'm going to just delete those guys. All right. How does our acceleration look? And it speeds up and slows down, slows way down, and then kind of wobbles, 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 wobbles. That's fine. Okay, acceleration on the Y. All right. 
change in velocity one step in the future minus one step in the past and then i'll change in time one step in the future minus one step in the past what did i do oh there we go delete that value that doesn't exist delete that value that doesn't exist all right so it looks like we've got some variation on the acceleration too. So let's take a look at that because we know our y acceleration should be in a free fall situation, should be exactly what, negative 9.8. And uh, we're kind of not there on some of these. But let's just go ahead and make our acceleration chart. Um, let's do the y acceleration. I'm excited to see that one. Okay, so I am going to control select my time after I had selected my y here to get them both selected. I am going to do a scatter plot and let's take a look at this. All right, it's kind of wobble, 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 right? All right, let's give this guy some axis titles. Let's give him a legend, and we'll do a trend line later, but not right now. All right, uh, let's see. Okay, so let's start manipulating this. Okay, go ahead and click on uh, this title bar. We want this, uh, what is it, uh, the legend, not a legend, but the number, number label. We want that to be on the bottom. So how we're going to display that is, okay, so the next axis, it's going to be low. It's going to drop down to the bottom. You can see we really only need one decimal, so I'm going to change from five decimal places to one. Same thing here. In fact, on this one, we don't even need any decimals, so I'm going to go back, click on that, zero. All right, great. And none of the values are higher than negative six, so on the axis, op axis options, my minimum, I'm going to change it to negative six. Just kind of spread that out there. Okay. And let's give this a chart title. Acceleration versus time. Y axis. Okay, and this is going to be our time. And this is going to be our acceleration. And acceleration we know is meters by second squared. So I'm just going to do a big old two. I'm going to select it. I'm going to go to home. And in font, I'm going to click this little drop down arrow. And I'm going to do a superscript. And boom, there we go. Nice and clean. All right. So our legend, I don't like the way it is. I'm going to put it at the top. And series one doesn't tell us anything. So I'm going to change our label on that. And the way to change the label on that is you click this little filter, you highlight that, you're going to click this little chart icon, and then you can name it. So acceleration, y axis. All right, and let's go ahead and add our trend line. Kind of plus trend line. Instead of clicking here, click the little drop down arrow there and choose the one that you want. So linear is good enough. Let's give it an outstanding orange color. Thicken it up a bit. All right, some nice dotted lines there. All right, and now we need to change the name. And we don't change the name the same way we did with this legend. We have to change it under. Our trend line options tab in the trend line name custom and then you can just call it what you want trend line is a perfect name there we go all right so you can see here in our trend line that we have a decreasing acceleration as time goes on but just barely we start out looks like exactly where we need to be about 9.8 and then we end up around 10.5 10.6 so that could be caused by a couple of different things it could be caused by uh, the warble um, from the camera shake, even though we stabilized the footage, the uh, algorithm sometimes introduces a war warble, and that might be what we're seeing, this up and down, up and down, up and down. Some of it due to the camera distortion, although the camera distortion I don't think is too bad to create this kind of uh, effect. Uh, and the other thing is, is that we just probably have some noise. Just as we had identified and clicked on that ball, we just maybe kind of, you know, didn't do it as cleanly as we could have. Um, but this isn't too bad. Our front line is exactly where it needs to be, so I wouldn't worry too much about this. Let's go ahead and look at the acceleration, X acceleration. So I'm going to left click and drag down to do all those. And you see it's it's kind of darkened right there to make it easier for you to click down and do some different models. I'll go to chart, start a call before we get to see all right, now look at this mess. All right, so let's go ahead and add some access titles. Some uh, let's give us a legend, and I'm gonna click this little thing and just put it at the top right at the beginning. Okay, so this bar here, label bar here, I want it at the bottom, so I'm going to go to uh, labels. Instead of next axis, I'm going to put low. Okay, and we got a lot of decimals on these guys, so I would say we only need one decimal for this, and one decimal for this. Okay. And we could probably come back at 2.07, so access options. Let's go to balance 0.07. There we go. That looks pretty good. Let's go ahead and add in a trend line here after I change the name of my series here on the legend. So I'm going to click that, change it to acceleration, X axis. All right, I did that by choosing the filter, highlighting this, and then clicking that little icon there and putting the title there. Okay, let's add our trend line. Instead of clicking the box, I'm going to click the arrow. I'm going to choose the one I want. Linear is good. Then I'm going to click on the linear one, and I'm going to go to the paint bucket here, choose a nice color, choose a nice dash type, make it a little bit bigger so it's easier to see. Okay, so what did our acceleration look like? The trend line of the acceleration looks like it's slowing down. Um, but just barely. It's pretty good. You can again see that warble. And in fact, if you overlaid the two, okay, 
You can see when one warbles up, the other warbles down, back. So again, I think that's that, that effect of that stabilization of algorithm. It's barely detectable to us when we look at it, but because our values are so close to each other, I mean, we're looking at uh, a very small values in change. Um, it really shows up on the graph. All right. So you would just do the same thing to get your velocity X and Y charts, and then you would have all four charts that you need. Uh, and let's do one more chart, just for giggles. And that's going to be our X position and Y position. So I'm going to choose X position here, and I'm going to choose Y position here. All right, let's go to charts, and let's do a recommended chart. And let's do the scatter one. This looks great. All right. And you can see that parabolic trajectory right there. So our X and our Y. And this is exactly how you would expect it. You threw the ball at an up angle, and it went down. Uh, so this is a, is a really great, beautiful chart. And in fact, if you wanted to do a curved trend line, I'm just going to go ahead and click linear, and we're going to change it. We're going to click on the guy, change the color. Let's give him a solid line. Click on the model. And then I'm going to go to this, and we're going to do polynomial. And boom. Oh, is it great? All right. So this is going to be our horizontal and vertical distance travel. Distance, yeah, I don't know how to spell travel off the top of my head. So there we go. Access titles. Let's do this. Horizontal distance in meters. Vertical distance also in meters. And I think uh, one decimal place is good on this. And one decimal place is good on this. So let's take a look at this. Our ball traveled almost three meters from the time it was thrown. Thrown from a height of almost two meters. All right. And so let's take a look at the original footage. I'm going to pull up DaVinci. And we have this two meter stick here. So let's turn that grid back on. Ooh. FX grid. Go back to here. All right. So this line here is about two meters. Yeah. So right about two meters. And uh, I'm just going to use a, a marker here on the screen. You can't see, but I'm measuring the two-meter stick with a pen. It's about that long. And how far did that ball fly before it landed? There we go. Yep, lines up perfectly. So in this video, we covered four different topics. How to prepare your footage before you even start filming it. By bracing the camera, using a tripod, uh, making sure that there's enough lighting and contrast. Just do anything to stabilize that footage as best as possible. Create a contrast before you even start filming. And then once you do film, we went into the second part, which was editing in DaVinci. We trimmed the length, so it's only from the beginning to the ending of the parts that we need to track. We adjusted the color and the contrast to really make the object stand out. We stabilized the footage, and we aligned it using the grid feature. Then for the third part, we went into Tracker, and we, we did our um, coordinate to make sure that we're starting right at x and 0 and ending right at y equals 0. Uh, we did our calibration stick to make sure that we were measuring it so that Tracker knows how far things have gone. And then we placed our little tracks that created those uh, two graphs to verify uh, for a QC. And then we copied all the turbo over to an Excel where we cleaned up the data, make it look nice and pretty, did our velocity and acceleration calculations, and created some really nice looking graphs. If you do all of that and you get those great looking graphs, I think you'll get really great results in your labs. Uh, if you skip these steps, and if you don't brace your camera and you're wobbling all about as you're filming it, your tracking is going to be all over the place and your graphs are going to be all over the place. And it's going to really show in your graphs because your graphs, instead of having that nice curves or those nice trend lines, your trend lines are going to be way off. Your curves are going to be all over the place. So this is to make sure that you do everything you can to make it as clean as possible. It's a lot of extra work than just taking that raw footage and going and uh, tracking it off and building it off of that, but I think it's worth it. Another comment about using Excel versus Google Docs. I know a lot of people like to rely on the Google Docs, especially because it has the collaboration tools on it. But just to let you know, as COS students, you have Office 365 as part of your tuition. Just go into the cos.edu page, load it up uh, through the banner, and then um, you can collaborate on there with your teammates the same as you would on Google Docs. And it has a much better functionality, much better tools. I think the efficiency that you gain by using Excel far outweighs any convenience that you may have uh, wished to have with Google Docs. All right, with all that said, I hope this helps. If you have any questions, drop it either in the Discord or in the comments below. And uh, good luck, and we'll see you later. Bye.